let's open with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this day because it is the day that you have made and we do rejoice and we are glad in it. Thank you for the vision that you've given this kingdom embassy. Thank you for a shepherd. Thank you for all those who've been called alongside to help. Thank you for our members, our partners, our friends from near and from far. We thank you that you bless us, you empowered us, you have enabled us to fulfill your will and purpose for our lives, but also to influence and impact the world and its systems to the glory of your kingdom. And we thank you that as this word is shared tonight, that it will bring edification, exhortation, comfort, and also a challenge for us to be fruit producers, much fruit. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm so excited again to be back with you. Much, much, much <laughs> request to go more into my book, Think Innovate and Create. And so I want to talk to us tonight about vision, about vision, the importance of vision. And I want to start us off in the book of beginnings. So you're following with me. Let's go to Genesis chapter one and verse one. It says, in the beginning, God, Elohim, created by forming from nothing the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and without and void or waste and emptiness. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. The spirit of God was moving, hovering, brooding over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God said, and God saw that the light was good, pleasing, useful. He affirmed and sustained it. And God separated the light, distinguishing it from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. And God said, let there be an expanse of the sky in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters below the expanse from the waters above the expanse. And God made the expanse of sky and separated the waters which were under the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so just as he commanded. God called the expanse of sky heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. Now we know well the story of creation and we can certainly go through all the verses and we're speaking of Genesis chapter one, verses one, all the way until we get to around this verse number 26. And here we see that God decided to create man. But as we talk about vision tonight, we actually get to see God's vision for the world and for humanity. And you'll say, well, April, how do we get to see that? Because what God intervisioned, what he saw inside is what he spoke into existence. Now you might be saying, how is that possible? Because you just read in the first few chap verses of Genesis 1 that God saw darkness and he saw void and he saw no form, no life. Yes, that may have been what his physical eyes saw, but what we see in scripture is not just what the physical eye saw, but we see what God intervisioned, what he saw within. And so we see here the power and the principle of the spoken word based on our inner vision, our inner thoughts, our inner beliefs. See, when God saw the darkness in no form, he didn't just say, it's dark, there's no form, 
There's nothing. There's no sky. There's no water. There's no man. He saw inside himself what he envisioned in spite of what was physically in his line of sight. I want you to hold on to that for just a moment. Because often we look around at our world and we see certain things and we think, hmm, that's just the way it is. That's how it's always been. Or this is just my lot in life. Or this is the side of the track that I came from. Or this is how we've always done it. But through what we see here in creation, we have the power and authority to speak to what we may see with our physical eyes into what we inner vision and call it forth to then be different than what our physical eye saw prior. And you say, well, how, April, do you surmise that we have that same power and authority? Let's go down to verse 26 in Genesis 1, and we'll find out just how. It says, then God said, let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness, and let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over the entire earth, and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. So, verse 27, I like the so, because the so says, they're with all. They're appertaining to. So God created. So because God said he was going to make a man in his image, not just a physical likeness, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness, and giving them complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, and over entire earth, and over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. Verse 27 says, so... God did what? He created man in his own image. In the image and likeness of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So once again, God in verse 26, we see his inner vision. His inner vision was, you know, let's make man in our image. Having our spiritual personality, having our moral likeness, and let's give him authority over fish of the sea, birds of the air, cattle, over the entire earth, over everything that creeps and crawls on the earth. So God then what? Because of his inner vision, he didn't just stop there. Because, you know, sometimes we have these great ideas, these great things that we want to do. And we just have these great things and ideas that we want to do but we don't speak to them. We don't act upon them, but that's not how God operated at all. In this book of Genesis, the beginning, we see the precedent for how we can cause to come into being those things which we vision within. So because God saw how he wanted the earth to look, because God wanted to create man, he did so, and so he did. And that also is the power and authority with which we have been given in creation. Verse 28 goes on to say that God blessed them. He granted them certain authority and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, Fill the earth, subjugate it, put it under your power and rule over, dominate what? People? Nope. Rule over and dominate fish of the sea, birds of the air, and every living thing that moves upon the earth. So this verse, verse 28, goes back to 26. So God saw what he wanted. He spoke it. He went to action to work on having it come to pass. And guess what? 
verse 28 again, he not only just said, here you go, man. He enabled him. He endowed him. And we talk about man, we're talking mankind. So that includes the women as well, that he enabled and endowed them with power to do what? To increase. I remember a few weeks ago, I talked about adding value, right? So a job that you're given or even what you have. And we see, we saw this, um, this principle outlined in the parable of the talents that what we get, it is our job. It is our responsibility. It is God's expectation that we add value to it, multiplying it. Here it is right here, being fruitful, multiply, filling, subjugating ruling over, not other people, but here it is specifically, fish, birds, and living things that creep. So yes, going back to verse 26, even the creeps. Um, but, but more importantly, God gave us an endowment and an empowerment with an expectation because God has a right of expectation to our lives. Mm. We hear that taught so well in our ministry, that God has a right of expectation to our lives. Paul actually says this, he says, what do you not know that your body is at the temple of the Holy Spirit? So we are to glorify God in our bodies, right? Renewing our minds, realizing that we are not of our own. We have been bought with a price. But here we see that God has an expectation to our adding value, but not just adding value to stop there, but also to multiply, to subjugate, to subdue, it says, and have dominion. So he wants us to take over, right? He wants us to be the best, the head and not the tail, scripture says, that we are above only and not beneath, but also that whatever he places into our hand and seed form, that we cultivate it, we provide the environment for which it can thrive, nourishing it, expanding upon it, developing and honing it, because we have to get to the domination part. And you say, where, where can we find that? Literally in the platforms that we're using. If you have a cell phone, which many persons have, uh, there are probably just a certain small amount of manufacturers, places where the minerals come from, uh, brands of phone, operating systems, for example, such as Microsoft. Microsoft has learned how to dominate the system for many of the things that we use from writing documents to presentations to um, spreadsheets to graphics to notes and so many things. They just keep building upon it, building upon it. And need we even talk about Amazon? Within 24 to 48 hours, whatever you need, if it's possible to get there in that time, you have the ability to receive a product within 24 to 48 hours. So when we talk about logistics, we talk about supply chains, we talk about, um, you know, getting things to the need, right? Supplying the need. These organizations have done it. Or simply going into your phone on an app to find out when a flight leaves, how to get a vehicle, or even what the weather is going to be later on in the day. These are systems, we call them operating systems from a technical standpoint, or even things like Cash App or Venmo, or digital currencies, cryptocurrencies. These are systems that are put in place to subjugate, to replenish, and ultimately to dominate different markets in our society, from finance, again, to business, even things being done in education, medicine, and the list goes on and on. But I want to go into 
talking about vision. And I like this quote by former First Lady of the United States, Eleanor Roosevelt, who said that great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. And so we can see that when we're talking about vision, we're talking about ideas. And God had an idea in his mind when he created mankind. Dr. Miles Monroe has a great book called The Big Idea. And I encourage you to get that book to read it. But God's idea of vision also that he placed within us and we can see further through scripture, the power and the potency and the potential of vision. In Proverbs 29, 18, it says that where there is no vision, people perish. And I want to look at that verse specifically in the Amplified, that's Proverbs 29 and verse 18. It says, where there is no vision, no revelation of God and his word. The people are unrestrained, but happy and blessed is he who keeps the law of God. So where there is no vision, there's no revelation of God, of who God is, his word, what is in his word, what authority and power we've been given in his word that we've been created in his image and likeness, not just physicality, but again, we talked about spiritual personality and morality. Where that's not known, people are unrestrained. So there aren't any restraints. Just do whatever you feel, whatever, whatever. There's not a focus. It's it's kind of like um, if when you go to the eye doctor, going to the eye doctor and they put this thing right here over your eye, and he starts to turn or she starts to turn this little thing to come into focus. And everything seems kind of blurry for a moment until it click, click. And you're like, oh, I can read that line. And they click, click back again. And they have you to read this line, you know, at a 20, um, 20, 20 distance. But what that's saying is where really there is no vision and there's no restraint. There's no focus to get anything done because you have to have a vision to even consider what to do to get something done. And so those who have no vision, according to Proverbs 29 to 18, perish because vision protects purpose. Vision helps you to choose the direction that you want to go. Vision provides discipline and vision fuels passion. Vision determines relationships and associations. I want to go back. Vision protects purpose. When you know what your purpose is, your vision aligns with that purpose. So all the things that you do, the goals that you set for yourselves, the, the things that you need in order to accomplish that vision, which is purpose for you, it aligns. So for example, at the present, there's a lot of tennis that's being played around the world. And I can tell you that when it's time for tennis and other sports that are coming back and to play it's like football, American football and football, also known as soccer, the vision to win, to be the champion, guides the direction that the athlete will train, will eat, will sleep, will wear, all of these things give direction. It provides discipline. So yes, early nights for sleep, early nights for practice. Would love to have french fries, hamburgers, or pizza, but guess what? We're in training. We've got a vision. We've got a goal. We have a focus. And that's what vision protects. Protects your purpose. It helps you choose your direction. It fuels your passion to know that, you know what? 
If I stay the course, follow this course until successful, I will obtain the prize. I will obtain the vision that I see for my life. Vision also determines relationships and associations because, you know, it's rare to see, for example, a tennis player that's practicing with someone who plays golf. You may say, well, they're both sports, so they both have to practice. Yes, but there are different skill sets specifically to those particular sports. Now, granted, yes, there has to be discipline of what they eat and exercise and et cetera, et cetera. But certainly the stroke of a backhand or the serve of a tennis ball would be a little bit different than someone who's determining which, uh, which putt or which um, uh, driver to use on a golf course club to use for a particular shot to get the hole in one. Two totally different things. And so even when it comes down to the people that you associate with, the relationships that you have, or the relationships that you seek, these are very important. And this is why I also share about mentors and coaches, because these persons also help you to remain focused. They're usually people who are in either your particular field that you're working or maybe people who are an experts in something that you need more information about. Even so, this vision that we're talking about that you have for your life, you re- it helps to determine your relationships and associations. And you know, we often hear from all of the leadership training pundits that you know you can't fly soar with eagles running around with turkeys or pecking with chickens. But so many times and too often, we look around and say, well, you know, I'm a chicken. This is where I grew up. This is what all the people around me are doing. They're just pecking away. What makes me think that I can be like an eagle? Just because I'm looking up in the sky and seeing the eagle fly with his wings to heights unknown. I'm just down here as a chicken. Mm. Vision says, I want to go up high. I want to soar. Like scripture says that we should mount up like wings on eagles. That God described as an eagle. Mm. The king of birds. That's what we are. That's what God wants us to be like, to soar above the circumstances, to have vision that is above just pecking with chickens. Guess what? (laughs) And I want you to follow this. So I was talking about it one day and someone says, well, you know, a chicken can't physically change itself into an eagle. I said, you know what? You're right. But if they're smart, they can figure out ways to attach themselves to an eagle. And so I had this picture in my mind. <laughs> oh, like a little platform, almost like a plane, right? As humans, we don't have wings to fly, but we are smart enough to have created an object that allows us to overcome gravity, have lift off to where we can go into the skies as well, and soar above the clouds. Mm. Think about that for a moment. Habakkuk 2 and 2 admonishes us to write our vision down and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. And there's a lot to get in when we're talking about making it plain because sometimes we write our visions down and there are these big, huge visions And we think, okay, now how is that going to happen in the next 30 days? Now, some things can, but not everything may. So we want to make sure that we set what we call SMART goals, right? SMART, that's specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and has a time to it. So don't just put down, you know, yeah, I want to be the CEO of Coca-Cola in the next 30 days. And you just got entry into Coca-Cola. Now, I know that there are 
executive search teams that sometimes in high level positions, they do recruit a new person or or senior management in a certain time frame. But but I want to but that's a little bit more of the exception than to the rule, because what I really want us to get is the fact that we have to write our visions down. That vision protects us. That vision is something that God showed us in the beginning, that we have the power, again, to speak to what we want to see, but then to also go into action to making it happen. So in order to have a vision, I share another acronym for what your vision should be, and that's PURE. Yeah, PURE. Detailed, specific plans that should be pure, positive, understood by you and others, relevant to the demand and to de- and to time. And they should be ethical. They should be within moral and legal boundaries. Once again, your plan should be pure. It should be positive because that's God, positively understood by you and by others. We know what God's plans are for us. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, the thoughts and the plans I have for you are good to bring you good things, an expected outcome of good. Joshua 1, 8 says, be strong and of good courage. If you meditate in the word and do what it says, guess what? Your outcome will be successful. Your outcome will be good. I know you're saying, April, please. It sounds great that you're saying everything's going to be good and everything's going to work out. But you know, in my life, that hadn't always been a reality. Guess what? It hasn't always been a reality in anybody else's life either. When we even look at Jesus' ministry and we see how he went about healing those who were oppressed, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, those who were held captive in their minds, some captive physically. Guess what? He had haters. He had people who questioned him, who sought to destroy him. He even had the, one of his closest disciples mm-hmm, that, well, I don't know if he stabbed. Yeah, he betrayed him. I'll say he betrayed him. We would say he stabbed him in the back. But then I was thinking about Peter cutting off the ear of the guard that came to arrest him because Judas betrayed Jesus. And Jesus sold him out. And sometimes that can happen. Whether it's friends, family, co-worker. Someone you thought had your back turned around and they left it wide open, right? So we've all had disappointments in life. We've all had detours, setbacks, whatever. But I remember something that Dr. Tim's story always says. Don't let your step back cause you to take a step back because God has arranged for your comeback. So even when test trials and tribulations come and it says that they'll come, It says, God is with us. He's for us, working in us and through us. That there is no temptation that is over, that has come, that is not common to all of mankind. But God is faithful and that he will provide a way to escape that we would be able to bear it. He promises us that he is the greater one living inside of us, that we can do all things through him. So even in the still times, even in the detours, God is with us. God is in us, Psalms 46 tells us, and we will not fail. God is in you, and you will not fail. Failure is only an event, it's not a person. So yes, there are times where it's our first attempt in learning, but guess what? We can get right back up and move forward. Making sure that our plans are positive, understood, that they're relevant, that they should be relevant. The plans that we have, should be relevant to the time that we live in and also relevant to what it is that you're trying to accomplish. And it should be ethical. Yes, within moral and legal boundaries. So to be pure. Environment plays a very important part in vision. And we look at this when I just read for you from Genesis 1 in the beginning, how much time God took to create the environment that he wanted, the environment that he knew would be conducive for mankind and also the fish and the birds and the flowers and the trees and all the things that he created. He had to ensure that the environment was right. He had to ensure 
that the environment was suitable in order to ensure that what he envisioned would come to pass. So one of the things that we have to make sure that we do is that we cultivate our environment. Remember when I opened, I talked about how we're to even come into God's presence and into his courts with praise and thanksgiving, being thankful unto him and blessing his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. And so we have to change our environment. Yes, some days it can be a nine to nine day. People, places and things don't always go the way we may expect them to, but but, but we have the power and the authority to change the environment with our words. That's why the words that we speak are so important. Scripture says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable. Yes, the words of my mouth, which comes from the meditation of my heart, because out of your heart flow the issues of life. As a man thinketh in his heart. Mm. So that's why it's important that we guard our eye gates and our ear gates. What goes into our heart, into our spirit, because out of it, we speak either words of life that build or words that tear down and destroy. So atmosphere is important. Ooh, time is running out. Just a few more, just a few more minutes. Proverbs reminds us that we are to get wisdom, to get knowledge, to get understanding. And the Hebrew word for light actually means knowledge. Yes, the Hebrew word for light means knowledge. But scripture tells us that wisdom is the principal thing. It is that which towers above all else. So in all of our getting, we should get what? Understanding. And so the first piece of knowledge that people must understand is their identity. And this was the first thing that God told Adam who he was. This is important on so many levels because identity is fundamental to relationship. And relationship is fundamental to life and community. We see this in our workplaces, as our job descriptions. This gives you, as an employee, identity, whether you're the chief executive officer, the, sir, the chief um, information officer, whatever it is, secretary, administrative assistant, manager, clerk, whatever your job is, it gives you identity. And from your identity comes your function. Ooh. From your identity comes your function, and your function correlates to your purpose. Ooh, this is so good. So knowledge is information and understanding is comprehension, but wisdom is the application of what you know. And so Proverbs 24 and 3 tells us that wisdom builds a house. Ooh, guess what? I'm looking at the clock and we're out of time. So you know what? At another time, we'll have to complete about vision. But I hope you found out tonight that vision is important, that vision protects your purpose. Vision also helps to discipline you with purpose. It chooses your direction, it fuels your passion, and it determines the relationships and associations that you should be around, reminding us that if you just keep hanging around with chickens, you'll just keep pecking. But when you look and set your sights up to eagles that soar and are determined that that's where you want to be, then you do what it takes, the investment, the sacrifice, the time put in to be with the eagles. And again, looking at God's example reminding us of how we shift and change our environment with the words that we speak, which flow from our spirit, from our heart. And why it's important, as David said, that thy word, O Lord, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And Psalms 118, he says that your word is a light and a lamp to my feet and path. 
So when God's word is in our heart, it helps us to navigate through life, but it also brings with it the promise of an expected outcome of good and not of evil. Father, I thank you for the word of God tonight. For those who are listening, I thank you that they are visionaries. I thank you that they set the environment, that they speak into their lives what they want to see and that they follow through with action, just as you did in the beginning. That when you created us, you fashioned us, you place your spiritual personality and moral likeness within us, giving us power and authority to use the word of God, to speak, to decree and declare, and it shall be. And so we are careful of the words that we speak over ourselves, over our family, over those who work with us, our friends. So we speak life, we speak good, as Philippians says, what things soever are true, are pure, are honest, of good a good report, these are the things that we think on. These are the things that we speak. And we thank you that the seed of your word has gone into good ground. And so now, as we provide opportunity for those who may not know Christ or have a relationship with him, we want to invite you to establish that relationship because that's the most important. Finding out who God is, learning about him, walking with him because he is integrally involved in your life. There is a specific reason why you are here. God wants to help you to discover that, but not just in discovery alone, but also to release those gifts and those talents to make the world a better place because you're in it. And so if you're there this evening and you're watching and you have not accepted Christ, if you're not invited him to come into your heart to establish a relationship, we want to invite you to do so. So just lift your right hand wherever you are and repeat this prayer after me. Father, I thank you for loving me, for sending your son to die for me. And so now I confess that any wrongdoings, any wrong thoughts, I ask you to forgive me of them. And I ask you to come into my life, make me a new creature in you. And I thank you that you hear my prayer and that you come into my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Welcome to the family.